Today is the 23rd anniversary of uh, the funeral of our daughter, Kate. I have very few memories of that funeral. I've blocked out all recollections of it, um, of the service, of a coffin being lowered into that hole in the ground, or anything else much. And that's how we protect ourselves. Some self-defense mechanism kicks in to save us. If that doesn't happen, we either die or we go insane. We're here this weekend as members of the club that nobody wants to join. The dues are high and there are no benefits. We're here because each one of us has lost a child and there is nobody in this world, no matter how much sympathy they have for us, who can understand what we feel other than those who have walked the same path we have. That's not to say that we've all had the same experiences. For some, our child never had a chance to draw one breath. For some, our child went to sleep one night and for some unknown reason never woke up. Some of our children died from illnesses or accidents. Others caused their own deaths, either accidentally or deliberately. And those deaths may be the hardest of all to bear. And then there's murder. Uh, this is an excerpt from a journal I kept during the months that followed the death of our 18-year-old daughter, Caitlin. The call from the emergency room of the University of New Mexico Hospital came just before midnight. The caller said Kate was there and had been injured, but would give out no further information over the phone. Don and I threw on our clothes and drove to the hospital. I sat in the passenger seat with my hands clasped tightly in my lap, the nails of one making gouges in the back of the other. I wanted to pray, but I didn't know what to pray for. I hated to press my luck by asking God for too much and offending him with my greediness, so I couldn't ask for this call to have been made by a prankster or for Kate to have suffered nothing more than scratches. I finally decided to confine my prayer to the request that she not have a head injury. Kate's tough, I told myself. She can deal with almost anything, fractures, disfigurement, even with life in a wheelchair. But please, oh please, don't let anything have happened to her brain. Uh, the space in front of the emergency room was reserved for ambulances, so Don dropped me off at the door while we he took the car across to the visitor's parking lot. The nurse who had called us was standing in wait in the doorway, and I knew that it had to be bad when she took me in her arms. You're sure it's Kate, I whispered. There's no chance it's a, a mistake. It's Kate, the woman said. There was a picture ID in her wallet. She's alive, but in critical condition. You need to prepare yourself for the fact that you may lose her. A car wreck? I couldn't conceive of any other possibility. Your daughter's been shot in the head, the nurse said quietly, and the earth fell out from under my feet, and I went under. So I was invited here today to share with you Don's and my story, and what I personally have learned since the loss of our daughter. Some of you will find some portions of your own experiences reflected in mine, and maybe that will help you find some peace. Some of you won't, and that's only to be expected, because we all go through the particular hell in our own way. All I can do is share my particular journey and hope that some of you at least will be able to relate to it. So here are a few things that I've learned. Don't believe everything that well-meaning people tell you. 
Believe what your heart tells you. Those well-meaning people may include your relatives, your spiritual advisor, your psychiatrist, or your best friends. They're trying to help you, but they're doing so from their own perspectives. If what they tell you goes against your instincts, don't accept it. The person to trust is yourself. Immediately after Kate's murder, the hospital sent a grief counselor to her, our home. And in an effort to reassure us, he said, don't assume that you're crazy if you hear your child's voice in the night. That illusion is experienced by the majority of people who are grieving the loss of a child. So I accepted that statement from this very knowledgeable man until it happened to me. I had just gone to bed and was nowhere near to sleep when Kate's voice spoke directly into my left ear. It was just as real as if she was kneeling next to the bed. And she didn't say, Mother, I love you, or any of the other warm, fuzzy things I would have given my, my life to have heard. She said, look at my phone bill. <laughs> well, I was in the process of settling her affairs, paying bills, settling credit card debts, so on. I hadn't yet opened her phone bill, so the next morning I did. And instead of automatically paying it the way I would have otherwise, I reviewed her long distance calls. When I did that, I discovered two calls to Orange County, California, made from Kate's supposedly unoccupied apartment minutes after she was pronounced brain dead. I dialed the numbers, both of them had been disconnected. I gave them to the police who said they couldn't trace them because they were unlisted. But an investigative reporter was able to do that. And the numbers turned out to be the home and beeper numbers for the head of an interstate crime ring that Kate was in a position to expose. Her boyfriend and his friends were part of that crime ring and Kate was breaking up with that boyfriend on the night of her murder. The boyfriend was with us at the hospital when Kate died, but he raced down the corridor to a phone and apparently called his friends who must have been waiting in Kate's apartment, and one of those friends made the calls to California. That led to our realization that there were layers to this nightmare that went far beyond the random drive-by shooting that police were insisting on calling it. That kind of experience has continued to occur off and on throughout all the years that our family has conducted our personal investigation of Kate's murder. When I hear Kate's voice, occasionally when I'm awake, but most often in dreams, and it gives me specific information, I ask our private investigator to follow up on it. And amazingly, this has led to some important discoveries. Maybe that's just coincidence, but maybe it isn't. I've spoken with many parents who have heard their dead child's voice. On many occasions, it probably was an illusion created by grief-befuddled minds, but there also exists the possibility that it wasn't. So the bottom line is we are the parents of these children. We know them better than anyone else in the world. Their fathers planted the seeds that caused them to exist. Their mothers were physically linked to them for nine whole months. And both are emotionally linked to them forever. It's up to us to decide what is and isn't real. And that knowledge is embedded in our hearts. A second thing I've learned is about the stages of grief, which do seem to fall into a predictable uh, sequence. 
Stage one, shock and denial, which create a sensation of numbness. We simply can't take it in. And that feeling is described perfectly in a poem by Emily Dickinson. The bustle in a house the morning after death is solemnest of industries enacted upon earth. The sweeping up the heart and putting love away we shall not want to use again until eternity. So that stage of numbness is a blessing. It acts as a buffer, protecting us from the shock of our loss. Without that buffer, we might not be able to survive. The second stage is pain. When the numbness wears off, it's replaced by searing pain. I hope that here this weekend, we'll all learn methods of coping with that pain and helping others to cope with it. The third stage is anger, directed according to the circumstances, but most often toward people we perceive as causing or contributing to our child's death. The drunken driver, the doctors who didn't do enough or didn't do the right thing, ourselves or other caretakers who didn't protect our child, and all the care few people whose children are happily romping around when our beloved child is dead. At God or fate or whatever supreme power there is who is supposed to be in control of things and has allowed the unthinkable to happen. And all too often at our spouses. Women and men tend to deal with their grief differently. Women are often spurred to action they turn into mother tigers. Uh, while men tend to withdraw into themselves, their work and their hobbies, and try to block out their pain. That isn't always true, but I think in the largest number of cases it is. Uh, I've read that 80% of all couples who suffer the loss of a child are divorced within two years. That did not happen to Don and me, but it very well could have. I'll never forget the day that Kate's sisters and I returned from uh, spending the day nailing reward flyers to trees to find Kate's father and brother in front of the television set watching a football game. <laughs> Here's another excerpt from my journal. It's not a very nice one. I'm not just sitting here, Don said, with ice in his voice. I put in a full day at work, and I'm trying my best to get my life back to normal. That's a whole lot healthier than what you're doing. You're obsessed with this crusade. You can't talk about anything else. You're not able to eat. You can't stay awake past 8.30. You're totally losing it. If you need to see proof, just look at your hands. What's wrong with my hands? I glanced down at them. I was surprised to find them covered with blood. The knuckles had been jarred through the skin by the jolt of the staple gun. Kate's dead, Don said. There's nothing we can do to bring her back. We need to start rebuilding our lives. I'm going to put up flyers from now until eternity, I said. If you try to stop me, I'm leaving you. I, I stomped out of the room and went upstairs to bed. It, it was, after all, 8.30. <laughs> well, we did manage to stick together as I got better control of myself and Don increased his active involvement in the investigation. And in that, we're in a, mo a minority. We're also a minority in that we have no closure. Our daughter was murdered and the case remains unsolved, which is why I eventually published my journal as a book, Who Killed My Daughter, to motivate informants and keep the facts of the case from becoming forgotten. 
Our anger is directed not only at Kate's unknown killers, but at the witnesses like the boyfriend who are afraid to come forward and a police department that fell down on the job. Because this is an unusual enough situation so it doesn't apply to most of you, I won't be addressing it now. Uh, later today, I think it's the last one of the um, sessions in the afternoon, Don and I will be co-conducting an interactive breakout session called Walking Through the Process Following Murder. And that's solely for the families of murder victims. I see in my program there is another such session also. Um, I, I hope those are scheduled at different times so they won't conflict. But parents of murder victims may attend either or both of them. Uh, the following stage, fourth stage, following anger come depression and despair. And that's the point when people are most likely to become self-destructive. They contemplate suicide or escape into drugs and alcohol. It's also a point when our bodies may turn against us. We're so drained emotionally that our immune system breaks down and we become susceptible to all kinds of physical problems. Our blood pressure rises. Our sleep is besieged by nightmares. In my own case, I suffered a couple of minor strokes. I know a number of mothers who develop cancer. This is a time of danger that we need to be aware of, so we recognize it when it becomes a threat to our health. This time of depression can last a very long time, and it's during that time that we often lose touch with our friends. Because the people who were so supportive at the time of the funeral and a short time afterward, uh, they begin to lose patience with hearing the same sad story over and over again. But we need to tell it over and over again. We need to share it. But our friends think hearing the sad rendition one time is enough. Shortly after Kate's murder, Don and I were invited to a Christmas party, and the hostess explicitly told us, you are not to talk about the murder. It's holiday time, and we want this party to be fun. Well, Kate's story was still all over the news, and people at the party were discussing it and some of them had the facts wrong. One man stated that Kate must have been a drug dealer. <laughs> well, she had never used drugs in her life. I corrected him and he challenged me. He said, what, what do you know about that family? I bet you've never even met them. <laughs> I said, we are that family. I couldn't restrain myself. We are that family. Immediately, we were the center of attention. The party was no longer festive, and when the hostess told us goodbye that night, she meant it. <laughs> we, were, we were never invited back to that house again. So it's during this stage that a support group, like Compassionate Friends, can literally be a lifesaver. It's a place where we're among people who understand exactly what we're going through and appreciate our need to talk about it because they have the same need. The other steps in this process involve recovery, coming to terms with what happened, resurrecting our lives, and moving onward. And one way that many people do that is through action. My friend Abby is the daughter of Warren Pritchett who was killed in Dover, Delaware when he was run down by a truck while riding his bicycle. The driver was charged with reckless driving and fined $50. Uh, Abby lobbied successfully to get the Delaware Senate to pass the Warren Pritchett Act to increase the penalty for careless driving causing death. Uh, there's MAD. I bet a lot of you know about that murders against drunk drivers. 
That was founded in 1980 by the mother of a girl killed by a repeat drunk driver and is now one of the most highly supported nonprofits in the nation. Parents of Murdered Children was founded in 1978 by the parents of a teenage girl who was murdered by her jealous boyfriend. Grayson's Legacy, a resource to educate parents and teens about the dangers of prescription drugs was started just last year by the mother of an honor student who experimented just one time with pills he found in a relative's medicine cabinet and he ended up dead. In our case, the only talent I have is writing. And I wrote Who Killed My Daughter and that got national attention. Frankly, I can't believe it really got published because it didn't have an ending. But uh, it was, and it got Kate's case in front of the public eye. And after that, we were approached by many other families who were in the same situation we were. Uh, their children were murdered, and law enforcement was not doing the job right. They, they were classifying some of these cases as suicides. They were classifying some as accidents, some, as in our case, random drive-by shootings. Um, these parents were frantic. They could not get their stories told because they weren't in a position to write a book and get it published. And if they had written one, it wouldn't have gotten the attention that mine got which I can only thank the fact that I had written so many books before that, that my name was known and that uh, teenagers who had read my youth books were now adults and they would read my adult book. And so I had that going for me, which most people didn't have. But we, we wanted to help these families get their stories known so um, we started the Real Crimes website as a resource for investigative reporters and true crime TV shows. And I uh, interview the families, help them word their stories, keeping them very short so they'll catch the attention of the media. And um, Don posts them and um, attaches documentation such as crime scene so photos and uh, for that reason we've got now I think close to 40 cases posted and some of those cases have been solved because the media discovered them and from there on outside investigators discovered them and Rule wrote a book about one of them which has just recently been published uh, and so in that way, we feel that we're giving Kate short life meaning. I wish I could tell you that the day will come when you no longer experience the pain of your loss. Personally, I doubt that it will. Part of me died when Kate died. As I sat by her hospital bed, holding her hand, watching the monitor blinking and beeping as it tracked her vital signs and knowing her organ recipient was already in the hospital getting prepped for a heart and lung transplant. I had what they call a near-death experience by proxy. I went to the edge with my child and Kate crossed over and I didn't. I gladly would have crossed with her, but I was turned back. The woman who came back to the land of the living was not the same woman who had been before that experience. My belief system had changed, my values changed, things that had seemed important to me before now no longer seemed important, and things that before had not been important were now very important to me. I had to adjust not only to losing Kate, but to being a parent with a piece of her heart missing. But I am here today, and you are too. And we are 
not just grieving parents, we are survivors. If we weren't, we wouldn't be here. We would have taken pills or driven off a bridge or stuck our heads in gas ovens. Instead, we've come together to share our stories, to learn from each other, to give each other strength and comfort, and to start the process of healing and to look for ways to give our children's lives meaning. Our loss will always be part of us, but believe it or not, over time, the intensity of the searing pain does lessen. We never forget, but eventually we learn to adjust. Here's an excerpt from the final chapter of Who Killed My Daughter? And this chapter was written two years after Kate's murder. Can I really exist in a world that doesn't have Kate in it? I can do that, I tell myself. Given that there's no choice, then I can do that. A breeze, still soft with the lingering sweetness of summer, moves over the branches of the elm tree that shadows Kate's grave, and a leaf breaks free and sails down to land beside me. Just another small death out of season. I close my eyes, and on the darkened screen of my eyelids, I produce the image of my daughter as I most want to see her. Tall and strong and lovely, Kate stands before me with her eyes sparkling with unquenchable mischief. Her glorious honey-colored hair is splashed with sunlight. She raises her hand in a comical half salute just as she did on the night she walked out of our lives. Later, I'll see you guys later. Goodbye, I tell her. Try to stay out of trouble, honey. I am wasting my breath, for she is already striding away from me, and my words go fluttering after her like a battalion of butterflies. Impatient for new adventure, she eagerly pushes aside the veil and, without so much as a backward glance at her mother, steps joyfully, confidently, forward into the light. So we are here this weekend to work together, to learn how to reach out to others, take comfort from others, live our lives productively, not only for ourselves, but for the sake of our deceased children. They were an extension of us, which is why we feel that with their deaths, we ourselves died, but we didn't and we are an extension of them. They live on in us, and by rebelling against the limitations placed by grief and living our lives to the fullest, we're offering them a chance to do that through us. So let's try our best to live up to that challenge. <laughs>